Great. Thanks so much, Nate. And thanks, everyone, um, for joining us uh, today for the latest in our series of Implementing Hypothesis for Publishers. A um, little bit about um, how uh, I plan to, to offer the webinar today. First, I'll just say a little bit about Hypothesis um, and add a little bit more detail about how it works. Um, I'll talk about how you can integrate Hypothesis um, with your website, either on your own or together with us. Um, I'll talk about um, one of our latest releases, publisher groups, um, and, and how that works. And then um, I'm going to do a little demo of um, some of the groups that are actually live now, so you can uh, actually explore that out in the wild. And then um, we'll have a little bit of time at the end, uh, hopefully, I don't plan to speak too long, for, for Q&A. So if you've not heard of Hypothesis before, I'm sure many of you have, um, we are a nonprofit um, open source annotation technology company. Um, we've been around for uh, several years now. You can see some of our funders uh, represented there across the bottom of the screen. Um, with a lot of consolidation happening in the publisher and vendor space, um, we think it's really important that for Hypothesis to serve as an independent voice uh, for users that um, we cannot uh, be acquired. Um, so that we're not beholden to shareholders. Um, we work with our community stakeholders um, to advance uh, annotation across the web. Oops, sorry, a little fast there. We work with the W3C um, to have annotation approved as a web standard, and that happened um, about 18 months ago. So what does this mean to have annotation approved as a web standard? Well, um, if there are, we believe that a healthy annotation ecosystem uh, should have many players. Um, if many annotation clients build in accordance with the standard, uh, annotations that I make using one annotation client should be able to interact with annotations that Nate makes, um, even if he uses a different client, in the same way that we can email each other today, even though we use different uh, email clients. Um, in the future, annotation will likely be built into browsers. So just like you tell your browser what your preferred search engine is today, you'll be able to indicate um, to your browser which annotation client you're using, and you shouldn't really have to touch it again. Um, we recently uh, celebrated 3.9 million annotations, and we expect to cross the 4 million mark um, next week, so stay tuned for that. You'll see that um, our usage goes up and down, um, and this really uh, currently aligns with the academic year. We have a lot of students um, in the education space who are using annotation as part of um, classroom assignments. If anybody on the call is interested in hearing more about how we're working with education uh, and our LMS integration, um, ask me during the Q&A, and either I or Nate can uh, can fill you in on how that goes. You'll see just by the um, the, the the different colors represented here on the chart. About 20% of annotations are made uh, in the public channel. About 20% are completely private. Um, and then a lot of the annotation activity actually happens in collaboration groups. We're eager to see um, how this mix might shift um, now that we have the publisher group functionality um, out in the wild. So how does hypothesis work? Um, hypothesis annotation happens on the version of record. So it keeps um, readers, it keeps researchers, authors, and the like um, on your site, keeps them returning to the site to view uh, annotations that they've made. There can be multiple conversations going on on one document um, all at the same time. There could be some uh, public annotations, conversations between researchers um, happening there. Uh, there could be a class working at, on the same document in a, in a private group. You may have invited experts to add um, uh, peer review or expert commentary. Uh, and, and other such groups. And um, all of that uh, can, be, can be toggled by the end user, depending on what they've come to the document to do. They can listen in on different groups. So um, there's a couple of pieces to the hypothesis um, architecture. Um, one of those is the client. That's the little bit that pops out in your browser from uh, typically the right-hand side of the screen. Um, and it's where you make the annotations and, and where you interact with them. And then those annotations are um, authenticated to the server um, where they're stored. So when you uh, land on a document on the web, um, a call goes out to the server and it says, are there any annotations that this user uh, should be able to see? That would include, of course, annotations that I've made myself. Uh, public annotations, and any annotations um, made in a group that I'm a part of. 
Um, Hypothesis was built with the idea in mind that um, organizations who are interested in running their own annotation server should be able to do that. Um, so we foresee a future where um, users will be able to access their annotations, uh, even though they may be on the back end um, stored on multiple servers. Um, recently, MDPI did launch their own annotation server. So those of you who are interested in maybe pursuing that, um, we can also talk a little bit more about that with you. So what does integrating hypothesis uh, look like? So there's a basic implementation. Um, we are an open source company. Our code base um, is available. Uh, if there's no cost to that, it's a very straightforward integration. Includes all of the primary annotation capabilities. Um, I'm told that it really doesn't take that long. You wouldn't even need to tell us about it. We would like if you told us about it because we'd love to be able to help you uh, be successful. But um, that's how the basic uh, in integration works. Um, here is just an example of the JavaScript that you would drop into your website in order to make the tool visible. Um, why would you want to do this? Well, right now, um, uh, researchers and end users can bring hypothesis uh, to any site on the web, but you may want to facilitate um, and raise awareness of the tool, and you can certainly do that um, quite readily. We also have um, plugins and integration available for other um, types of services. I mentioned the LMS integration that's coming, um, Canvas and other LTI compliant um, LMSs. Uh, this is very important because students can use um, their student accounts for single sign-on. Uh, we can integrate with instructor gradebooks and the like. Um, there are accounts for Drupal, Omeka, um, OJS, uh, which I'll show you an in integration with OJS in just a bit. Um, WordPress, uh, which of course powers a significant amount of content um, on the web. And we also work with all of the, the major platform hosts um, here, as well as some publishers who serve as uh, platform hosts for smaller publishers. Um, we're going to be sharing these slides, so the links in here will be clickable to you, and I provided a link here in this slide um, where you can see more about hypothesis integrations and tools. You can also make um, configurations for Hypothesis. This is just an example. It's a little bit more JavaScript than just the one line that I showed you. But for example, if you wanted um, highlights to be off by default, um, you could actually uh, do that in JavaScript. Um, I've, I've got a slide coming up in a bit with some of the other configuration options, and there's a link here um, to the full configurations. Uh, for every um, user and every group, we do provide an annotation um, dashboard. You can use that dashboard to browse or search uh, for users, uh, individual tags, um, URLs, uh, different groups. Um, and we just recently announced um, wildcard search. So now it's even easier for publishers who are interested in seeing what uh, types of annotations um, have been made uh, on, on their domain or on specific um, path on their domain, you can, you can do that. We're happy to tell you a little bit more about that as well. Um, so with Hypothesis, of course, um, you, can, you can annotate on any of the major digital formats um, as well as data. If you can view it in the browser and you can select it, then you can annotate it. And one of the great things about the tool is the document equivalence. So this means that a conversation happening on the HTML will carry over to the PDF and the EPUB. Um, it also means that, uh, for example, uh, publishers who have content on multiple locations on the web, you maybe have it on your website, on PubMed Central, you might have it in an aggregator like EBSCO. Um, again, a conversation can span all of those locations. Uh, PDFs that might be uh, in institutional repositories or the like. Uh, again, we look for um, in certain metadata tags, uh, PDF fingerprints and the like, so that you can ensure that there's one conversation. You won't miss out just because um, you're on one format or one location and someone else is working on it elsewhere. We also have a very robust um, API. Um, and we think this is really a, a critical part of our mission. Uh, you can do many, many things with it in terms of um, reading annotations, searching them, uh, creating them, updating, deleting them. You can even now, as part of the work that we're doing for the education space, uh, create groups and sort users' individual groups. Um, so that is a, is a, is a big step forward. Um, as a company that's working towards um, you know, annotation more broadly, 
um, we think this is really important that users should be in control of their data. Organizations that implement hypothesis should be able to get their annotations out if they want to repurpose them for text and data mining or um, display them you know, in a feed on another part of the browser. You can certainly do that um, if you want to take them out of one annotation tool and put them into another. We've done experiments um, across other tools and, and this works um, quite well. Um, so publisher groups. Just let me tell you a little bit about um, what publisher groups are. Um, up until a couple of years ago, a lot of the uh, annotation activity, as I mentioned, was happening with students and individual researchers. Um, certainly, uh, publishers were keeping an eye on what was happening in the space. Um, eLife uh, approached us and they basically said, hey, you know, we think this is a great tool, but there are some things that we believe, um, you know, we would like to have in place as a publisher. We think other publishers would like, and they uh, generously um, uh, worked with us to develop these features. So for publisher groups, this is something that um, we work with you. Uh, you can't do the full publisher group setup um, without us, but we're happy to work with you on it. Um, we use a document-based uh, pricing. We want to make sure that publishers of all sizes can actually participate and use um, Hypothesis. So uh, this, uh, it scales. Um, the more documents you put in, the cheaper it is per document. Um, we use the amount of content that you add in a year as a proxy for publisher size. We found that this is a little bit uh, better than using a per journal fee because uh, some journals in the humanities and social sciences might add a dozen articles in a year, well, um, some articles in the science, hard sciences might, might add, you know, 5,000. So we look at how many you add per year or how many uh, book chapters or entire books you want to deploy across. And we just use that to, to gauge your publisher size. Um, you can still go back and deploy hypothesis to volume one, issue one, or to your earliest copyright year. The great one of the great things about the tool is it works backwards um, as well as forward. If you have um, your own account system that a lot of um, users are um, are already working with, we can integrate with that um, through single sign-on and OAuth. Um, we've got a couple different types of um, publisher groups, which I will show you. And, and working with us enables you to have um, unlimited uh, groups of different configurations. Um, open groups that anyone can join, uh, world readable on your page, and, and world writable as well as restricted groups that maybe you have for a specific purpose um, where you control who uh, will be able to annotate to those groups, but everyone who lands on your page um, will be able to see those annotations. Um, customization, uh, customer support, um, open source maintenance, so we can ensure that um, we can keep uh, improving the code base and the community that's working on Hypothesis uh, can benefit from those improvements. And, Really one of the important things that Nate and I work on and, and, and talk about all the time is each publisher, um, you know, is, is selecting annotation for a specific purpose. So what does that success look like? What have we um, determined around best practices? Uh, what kinds of training and outreach? What types of activities you can do to encourage um, annotation on your site? So let me go out of my presentation here and actually show you some publisher groups. So I mentioned eLife. Um, here is uh, an eLife article. Um, and uh, you can see, uh, if for those of you who use Hypothesis yourself, the eLife integration looks a little bit different. Um, and eLife launched this beautiful uh, new platform uh, shortly before annotation went live and they really wanted to have uh, in annotation fit in with their page and we believe uh, you know publishers uh, should be able to customize the site so that's one of the things that um, eLife supported. The eLife integration connects to eLife accounts um, as I mentioned uh, as a possibility so anyone can participate in this group they just need to make a profile um, on eLife have your ORCID handy if you want to do that and experiment with it. You see at the top of the annotation pane, um, the eLife branding. Um, another feature that we developed um, for eLife is a moderation flag so that publishers who host their own publisher groups can moderate annotations that appear there. Um, I will point out that we do have a moderation flag in the Hypothesis public channel. We take care of that um, ourselves. Uh, but in this case, if, if I were to click the flag, an email would go to the designated moderator at eLife um, to be able to review those annotations. Um, I know that eLife also uses the, e the API so they can monitor in real time annotations that are made across their site um, so they can take a look at them. 
some of the ways that eLife has promoted annotation are authors updating their articles. Um, certainly we see interaction with, um, with end users. And this uh, article, as you can tell by the bright red banner, has a correction. Um, so I like to show this one because the eLife um, actually added more information in the form of an annotation card as to what um, precisely had been corrected. In this case, um, it was a missing citation here. So it's a, it's a great use to show you. Um, so again, this is an open group. Then we have publishers who have um, more specific annotation needs in mind uh, when they come to us. Um, and for them, we offer restricted groups. So the American Diabetes Association, every January, they publish an update to the standards of medical care and diabetes. And they wanted to have a mechanism to add updates uh, without waiting for the next year to come around. So we created um, this restricted group. Um, it's Again, it's visible to anyone who comes to the site. Uh, the, the sidebar is open by default, so everyone will see these updates. Um, and the only folks who can actually contribute annotations here are the staff of the American Diabetes Association that oversees these. We think they did an amazing job um, with uh, this integration. Um, they really treated each annotation as a first-class research object. So you can see um, the date that the annotation was uh, originally published. You can see the date that the annotation was approved. And they've provided um, a suggested citation as well as some helpful tags. Um, the links here go to um, other items within the publication in some cases, um, external sites. Uh, and others, and you can see if I scroll down here that they've even included um, a glycemic um, table there. Um, now, the American Diabetes Integration uses hypothesis accounts in the back end, so in addition to the group, you also get um, the dashboard or activity page for that. So this is a, where, a, a place where readers can actually look at all of the annotations that have been made um, across the domain. This could also be across a given journal, it could be across a, a book, um, it's completely up to the publisher, and folks can go in and actually see what other annotations are there, visit those annotations in context, um, and explore them that way. So this, uh, this was our first restricted group um, that was launched this past spring. Another example of a restricted group is a project that we did together with Cambridge University Press and Syracuse University's Qualitative Data Repository. Um, this is a project uh, that is called uh, ATI, or for Annotation for Transparent Inquiry. And it's designed to provide transparency around citations in the social science to help the authors of those publications uh, just provide more information. Um, and some of it uh, because of funder mandates, others because maybe space constraints uh, kept information out of the publication. So you can see, um, if you scroll down, the authors have been able to um, add uh, these detailed notes around um, uh, text that might just be you know, one line in the text and, and one citation. Uh, information about their sources, their methodology, and the like. If the original information came from another language, authors could, for example, put uh, translations in. Um, here you'll see in this um, second example, there have been other sources in, uh, in Russian that the authors have used. Uh, there's a link back to the data, as well as some other um, citations. Um, the, it happened that about a dozen of the articles that were worked on in the original workshop um, with QDR were across Cambridge publications. So we launched this group with Cambridge. There are other um, articles uh, with about five or six other publishers, so we're in the process of making those um, uh, annotations visible on top of the content on those publisher platforms. Again, because this uses um, hypothesis accounts in the back end, um, there's access to a group activity page um, where you can see all of the articles that have been worked on as part of the project and you can go in and, and, and see those articles and the like. So we thought it was a really amazing use case and we're really excited that this um, workshop continues uh, this fall across um, what will now in effect be preprints so that the annotations that the authors add around their sources will be able to inform uh, peer review. Um, speaking of peer review, I just want to show you one more example of a publisher group. Um, this is an interdisciplinary journal called Murmurations that we've been working with, and this is hosted on the uh, PKB, PKP version of OJS platform. And um, the, uh, this journal is, is, is really focused and centered around open peer review. So they've made, um, for each article, they have uh, what's in effect a restricted group where the author 
the editor and the reviewers um, can uh, participate in the group, um, have a conversation on the manuscript. Uh, if we scroll down here a little bit, we can see how the, how the replies look. And then um, once the conversation is set, it's there, it's world readable um, for folks who come to the journal um, and we're exploring um, how we can expand this type of open peer review um, perhaps with, with other interested publishers. So these are just a few examples of, um, of publisher groups um, in the wild, but we're happy to tell you more about any of these. Let me just go back um, into my presentation, almost done. Let's see here. So I uh, just wanted to tell you a little bit more detail about what comes with the publisher groups. As I mentioned, that is the paid service. Um, currently, you can customize a number of things here. You can see you know, colors, borders, typefaces, um, uh, highlights, calls to action. Um, and you can also customize, not on this slide, but the behavior of the sidebar. So you can decide whether you want it open by default or closed by default. You can control the width, um, for example. We want it to really fit. Um, into your site so that it looks, uh, you know, belongs there. Um, we want to work together, um, as I mentioned, in, in an engagement strategy. Um, this usually a conversation starts even before um, an agreement might be in place. Um, you know, what, what are your uh, problems that you're trying to solve through annotation? Um, what types of um, assistance we can give you uh, from our side uh, and what we're learning from all of our partners? And um, we're happy to work together, you know, with you on promoting uh, the capability that the capability has been added to your platform. We'd love to work together with you in webinars, um, conference panels, and to put together case studies and white papers on how you are using annotation. Um, part of the collaboration is, of course, um, support and the open source um, maintenance fee. Um, there's a lot of work that our engineering team uh, puts in uh, to regularly improve and maintain uh, the service. Um, it's something that, you know, we're focused on um, the end user and, and what their needs are um, all the time. We're very strong believers in, in standards, as I mentioned, and interoperability for the future um, of annotation tools. Uh, and we heavily support the community around annotation. Um, we do, uh, we started in 2015 uh, a coalition called the Annotating All Knowledge Coalition, which is free to join. Um, it currently numbers uh, more than 70 publishers, um, uh, platform hosts, technology companies, and also universities. Um, and every year we host uh, the largest conference in the world that's dedicated to annotation. Um, coming up in the spring, it may be on the East Coast this year, I've, I've heard a rumor, uh, but it brings together folks from all of the different uh, verticals who are using annotation, uh, many, many different annotation um, tool providers, and we have a lot of unconferencing time and workshop sessions where you can dig in deeply as well as a, as a hack day. So if you wanna learn more about that, don't hesitate to, to contact us there. Um, I just want to mention that we offer, um, you know, full analytics. Uh, so if, if um, increasing engagement and, and learning more about that engagement is, is one of your uh, needs around um, uh, embedding annotation, um, you know, we certainly can provide you a lot of detail. For every annotation that's made that's uh, publicly viewable, you'll be able to see who made it, when it was made, on what document, what the selection was, and what that particular user had to say. Uh, for things that are private or part of private groups, we can still give you um, information. You can see when an annotation was made and on which document and which part of the document. So it's still a, a valuable metric um, to, to look at uh, in engagement and attention. Um, one of the things I really didn't uh, talk about today because it's not uh, connected directly to publisher groups is um, uh, automated entity annotation. Uh, for example, in uh, I think about 125 journals in the neuroscience space, uh, they use for reproduci reproducibility purposes, research resource identifiers. Um, and so we have a group out of UC San Diego that created an account called Cybot. You can see it here in the little, in the legend here, the purple. And when um, there are RIDs located in a paper um, that resolve uh, two external databases, 
the Cybot account automatically looks for those and brings them up in form of annotation cards. So when we're showing publishers their annotations, if they do have publications um, in that uh, discipline, um, it's quite likely that you have Cybot annotations over your content that you might want to make visible to users. Uh, but you can also see the breakdown here. Um, if, there's a, if there are groups, um, we can show you um, what the breakdown is in the activity between private and, and group uh, annotations. And now that we have the, um, the publisher group functionality, you know, we'll be able to provide even more detail um, across that. We can give you information on the number of users, the number of um, monthly actives, the number of documents. You know, really, uh, as Nate likes to say, we can probably give you information on everything. Uh, just let us know what's going to be most useful to you. We'll work with you on that. Um, I just wanted to close, um, you know, with a quick um, slide. It's impossible to keep these things up to date, but these are some of our uh, partners that we're working with. Um, uh, University of California Press, which just announced is not on here yet, um, uh, neither is MDPI, so we'll have to be updating the slide um, shortly, but you can see, um, you know, a wide array of um, different uh, partners across um, the humanities, across the sciences, uh, both books and journals um, uh, around the world that we're working with, and um, we'd be very honored if you'd consider um, joining us and, and adding your name to this list. That is all that I have in terms of prepared slides, but I'm happy to take any questions. Hey, Heather. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions that have come up in the chat already. So um, Kim has uh, asked if we have an example of a site that's restricted in the sense that a reader submits a comment and then the comments reviewed by the site editor and released or not released depending on its content. Yeah, we have had um, uh, requests for that. Um, we call that uh, in our internal, internal terminology pre-moderation. Um, right now, the, the moderation capabilities I showed are, are post-publication uh, moderation. Um, we are looking at um, doing that, doing something in that space um, in 2019. So if that's a particular um, use case um, that you'd like to explore, you know, let me know and we can talk about it further. Um, I mentioned that you can utilize the API and you can utilize the, um, the group activity page to see real-time um, annotation happen. Um, so our publishers uh, who have groups with post-publication moderation do frequently use those uh, mechanisms to see what's happening on the site, um, and they can, you know, review those annotations, and if there's a, if there's a problem with them, uh, they can flag them and take care of them right away. We haven't um, noticed uh, a sig we've, there's barely been any instances, even in the Hypothesis public channel, um, where annotations have had to be taken down. We know as awareness um, spreads of the tool, we, we certainly you know, expect that to happen. We know that in some disciplines, it's a larger concern than others. Um, but um, again, you know, we wanna reduce the amount of friction that there is uh, for users to get started in annotation. Um, and uh, we're happy to give um, references from publishers using the post-publication moderation if you're interested to find out um, how that works for them and whether they feel that's sufficient. Great. Um, and then also uh, com in a completely different direction from Craig, um, he notes that uh, it seems like Hypothesis is optimized for desktop use and is wondering um, how it works on smaller devices. Yeah, so I do use um, Hypothesis on my phone. I have a, a, an iPhone um, 6S. It's, it's not very glamorous. My kids all have better phones than me. Um, so part of it depends on your comfort level with the size of your screen. Uh, it definitely works. I'd say an iPad mini or an iPad um, works beautifully. Um, we do have um, some new uh, developments um, you know, that, that we're thinking about in terms of um, how to make that mobile experience um, you know more more adaptable and and work more smoothly um, and we'd love to hear your feedback on that but I do use it myself uh, and um, I'm happy to say that as long as you have a, a modern phone uh, you can definitely take advantage of hypothesis yes and I'll just say that um, I also use it on mobile and I do find that um, you know, the reading experience of annotations is possible on a smartphone uh, fairly comfortably, but just due to the screen real estate, it's a little bit harder to also make annotations. And so uh, a tablet, uh, you know, moving up yeah. to at least the tablet size screen space helps with that quite a bit. The students, they're so adept though, they can probably make those annotations like a 
like a charm. Yeah, maybe they have uh, more nimble fingers than I do. <laughs> uh, so other questions, folks. Um, I uh, shared your email address. It's also up there on screen, Heather, for people who are interested in uh, making a more direct connection, uh, especially around references um, for the moderation or, or other issues. Um, so I've asked folks to get in contact directly. Yeah, we also have a lot of information um, available on our website, um, which is uh, as hypothesis at the publishing uh, page, as well as the we have a developers page as well, which has a lot of information on uh, documentation for the for the API. Um, we've got some uh, annotation uh, annotation technology embedding best practices there. We've got 10 questions you may want to ask yourself if you're selecting uh, an annotation provider. I have a five minute uh, demo from a researcher perspective um, that's there. Uh, so uh, lots more that you can find out. 